There are thousands of us on this property, on other properties, on screen. And I'd like for us to take this moment and say the most beautiful name that has ever come across human lips. Together, say his name. Jesus. What you did was cause angels to bow. The Father slipped up on his throne and looked. Devils began running. Satan began trembling. What's his name? Jesus. That name is above every name. One day, every human that has ever lived is going to bow and call him Lord, whether they like it or not. There is none higher, none greater, none better. His name is Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. He shed his blood. He died a miserable death on a cross. They buried him, but three days later, Jesus walked out. And right now, Jesus is praying for every one of us. Think of it. He knows our name. We call His and He knows ours. Father, I worship you today for sending Jesus. And I thank you that I know that name. I praise you that my sins have been eternally washed away and I've been made a new creation. And I pray this for all the believers. We are thankful, O oh God, that your spirit reached out and drew us. And now we know the truth. I pray for those who don't yet know Jesus in this way. May they come to realize that Jesus is alive. He is real. He is not a religion. He is a person. And we worship that person. In the name that's above every name, we pray and praise all the time. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Read a verse of Scripture with me, if you would, please. Stephen's going to take us to James chapter 1. And we'll read the first four verses together. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Stop. Have you done it? Can you do it now? If you're in a trial, let's stop for a moment and consider it a joyful thing. Can you say praise the Lord? See, that was, again, that was really weak. No, you can do this. This word is true. If you're thankful, wherever you are, that God is real, praise Him right now. All right, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Thank you for being seated. One of my best friends in the ministry who's gone on to be with the Lord Dr. Paul Walker, who pastored the Mount Perrin Church of God for 30-some-odd years and then became the general overseer of the denomination. He and I spent lots of times together. We camped out in tents in the uh, Negev Desert in Israel. We, we did a lot of things together. He preached one time with tears streaming down his cheek. He said, brothers and sisters, this is a hard life. And I thought at that point, now, why in a day when everybody's saying you have what you say, and if you're going through trials, it's because you don't have enough faith. 
and we ought to be running around bubbling with joy all the time, why would this great man of God say this is a hard life? He said it because his 21-year-old son, who had just entered the ministry, was killed in a head-on collision by a drunk driver. He never got over it. You never will. There are certain things in your life that will scar you forever. Well, scar you for this life. I want to say that today at the expense of sounding pessimistic. This is a hard life. Christianity is no game. This is war. Brother, when you decided to follow Jesus, you insulted hell. Hell hates Jesus. And since you are full of him, you are the target. You are the object of Satan's attack. This is a hard life. And it's one thing after another, one trial after another. It's never over. It won't be over till Jesus comes. This is a long journey. Several weeks ago, I preached from this verse I'm about to read to you. I don't know why some verses stick with me, but this one did. This is when God had delivered Israel through the Red Sea and they had begun their journey through the wilderness. And when they got to a certain place, a nation threatened them. They fought that nation and won, but then there was another nation that said, don't come on our property. And these very weary former slaves had to go around the long way to preserve their lives. The Bible says, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. In that hot place, even though God provided a cloud from the sun and warmth from the cold, He didn't do anything about the rocks and the sand and the weariness of their human bodies. And when they thought they could get from here to there, they find themselves uh, going in circles, a, a roundabout way, which only made the journey that much harder and they just could not understand why God would do this to them. And that's the journey we're on today. And this is a long, hard journey. And we find ourselves having to go around things and deal with things and when this problem is solved, another one pops right back up and it's like we can't get a breath. There are some things we've been praying about for decades that never seem to be any closer to an answer. Then you add on the new little things, the little fires everywhere all the time. You'll understand why James said you've got to let patience have its perfect work. It'll work out. God will work it out. I preach from the book of Revelation a lot. I find that in the very first chapter, John addressed the churches and he said, I, John, I'm your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He had a word for them. He had blessings for them. But he said, this is coming from a man who's with you in the tribulations of life. I'm your brother. I'm going through the same thing you are. The kingdom of heaven is a violent thing. The violent have to take it by force. And he said, I'm your brother and companion in the patience of Jesus Christ. Meaning, when you understand what Jesus is doing, you realize that he has begun something 
and the completion will take a long time, but it will be completed. And to the church at Philadelphia in, in that next two chapters, he said, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world to try them that dwell on the earth. Look at it. Because you have trusted my word, because you have served me anyway, you kept my word with patience. You cried because you couldn't get relief and didn't see an answer. You wept, you begged, but you kept on believing. And because of that, I will deliver you from the punishment and the trials of the end time, and I will reward you for your patience. Patience. Patience, church. In Acts chapter 14, Paul has gone into Derby, and when he preaches, they pick up stones, they knock him down, they drop heavy stones on his head, and then they pelt his body with smaller stones. He was so badly beaten and bruised and stoned, they thought he was dead, so they just drug him out of town and left him outside the gates. Can you imagine? I've had a lick in the head. <laughs> it hurts. But he was stoned. Flesh was hanging. Blood was flowing. Eyes were black. Cuts were obvious. And there he lay in the dirt. But here came the brothers, and they gathered around Paul. I don't know what happened there, but he got up. And the Bible says when he got up, he went into some other towns and said, let's go, fellas. I've got some preaching to do. Now, can you imagine when a bloody, cut up, beat up, stoned, Apostle comes into town and says, hey, I want to tell you some good news. <clears throat> Man, is this life worth living? Let me tell you about eternal life. Let me tell you about a Jesus who can give you life. Then when he finished there, he said, well, come on, let's go back to Derby." And they, and they said, well, they, they tried to kill you there. He said, and? And I've not finished my job yet. I've got something to say to these people. There are believers there. And I want to tell them how good God is. So the Bible says he went back into Derby and he encouraged the souls of the disciples. Now who's doing the encouraging? The beat up apostle is saying, stay at it. Let me encourage you. God is a good God. God's a faithful God. Then it says... He told them to continue in the faith. Keep it up. Don't quit for any reason. If they hit you with a rock, keep praying. If they knock you down with a stick, keep praying. If they put you in jail, pray anyway. Don't ever quit. Continue in the faith. And then he says, by the way, we through much tribulation must enter the kingdom of heaven. It's going to get worse. It will never be over till we stand in front of Jesus. Many of you are praying for it to be over. It will not, even if this one gets solved <laughs> and you take a deep breath, get ready, the next one is coming. Every day for over six months, every single morning for over six months, I have quoted a scripture. It's the first scripture that comes out of my mouth. It's Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4. Since the beginning of the world, no man has heard nor perceived by the ear, neither has any eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness and remembers you in your ways. Do you mind if I break that down this morning? There's, you see, in every other religion, 
If you'll do something, God will do something for you. This is the only faith that says God tells me to wait so he can do something for me. Hallelujah. So the first thing he says is God acts, A-C-T-S, for the one who waits. Then he says, God visits the one who rejoices and does righteousness. That means God sets up an appointment with you. If you continue to rejoice no matter what it looks like or how it feels, and you keep on doing the right thing. You don't have to have a good feeling to do a good thing. You do it because God will bless you for it. There's an appointment waiting on you if you'll rejoice anyway. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations because this is God completing a work in you. But then he says, the one who remembers him in his ways. Ah, so I've got to wait, rejoice, and remember. But what am I remembering about his ways? Especially since the same Old Testament prophet said his ways are past finding out. I can't get to the bottom of God's heart. I don't know the comprehensiveness of his thinking, but God has done certain things in certain ways, and I have seen them in Scripture and in my life. So how do I remember God in his ways. Let me take you to Exodus chapter 23. I want you to remember the ways of the Lord. He says before he leads them into the promised land, I will send my angel before you and I will bring you into the land. I will send my fear before you. I will cause your enemies to be confused. Listen to this one. I will even send hornets among your enemies and make them scatter. But watch this, church. He said, I will not drive them out from before you in one year lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. No, little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. That's the way of God. That's what he wants us to remember. Remember, who remembers him in his ways. That's his ways. God does not do everything at one time. God does it by drips and dribbles if you don't mind me using that term. We want God to do it now. We want it all done now. But God has a reason why he won't do it that way. See, what he's doing in your life is, is about as fast as a glacier. But it is moving. And as it is moving, it is reshaping the contour of the land. Let me tell you something. When you think God's doing nothing, remember these words. I will send my angel before you, and I will drive them out little by little. I won't do it all at one time, just a little bit at a time. And there's a reason for it. Do you mind if I preach to you for a minute? There's a reason for this. He said, if I were to do it all at one time, the land would be desolate. Meaning, you'd be back here, I'd be up there and the land would just grow weeds. It would not be taken care of. It would be overgrown. And wild animals would move in, far worse enemies than those people I'm driving out because the wild animals uh, will tear you, rend you, destroy you, kill your children. And then I began to wonder, well, how does this apply to me? Well, you see, the Lord knows that if he were to do it all at once, we'd get comfortable. So the Lord says, stay close. I'll do this a little at a time. I'll cut this one down. I'll cut that one back. I'll move this. I'll obliterate that, but you stay close. I'm not going to run ahead of you. 
because I don't want any space between us. Because if I get too far ahead of you or you lag too far behind me, that thing of desolation might come into your life where you are comfortable and unmoved and unstirred and you feel like you don't need me. You take a deep breath and you say, whew, I'm glad that's over. And then you pray less and then you're less spiritual and less hungry for God. If I were to move far ahead of you and you were to stay far behind me, wild animals would move in, wild animals of uh, self-confidence and complacency and again, comfort. And you would not hunger for me and you would not be able to reach out and touch me and grope for me, touch the hem of my garment. No, I'm not doing it quickly because I want you to stay right behind me and I want to stay right in front of you. So that's why I do things little by little. I know what I'm doing and I know when I will finish it. I will go before you and you will stay close behind me. Let me say something to you, brothers and sisters. There is no such thing as a leap of faith. You hear that all the time. I took a leap of faith. <clears throat> Nothing like that exists. Everything is a step of faith. One at a time. God told Joshua, everywhere you set the soles of your feet belongs to you. I will give it to you. He talked about steps, not leaps and jumps, but daily steps. And that's why the Bible says we move from faith to faith and from glory to glory because in the little moves and the tiny progress, we stay close to God. And that beautiful thing that James talks about, patience, is more strongly developed in our lives. Let me tell you, God has an appointed time for everything. Do you hear me? There was an appointed time for Noah to build an ark. There was an appointed time for David to be king. There was an appointed time for Jesus to be born. There was an appointed time for Paul to come into the world. There is an appointed time for Jesus to come back to this earth. Yes. But in your life, there is an appointed time when you will see the salvation of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. Yes an answer from the almighty hand of the Lord. It's already set up. It's an appointment. And brother, let me tell you something. Lots of people don't like to hear this. All the fasting and praying in the world is not going to change God's appointed times for things in your life. He knows what he's doing and he knows how he's going to do it. And that's why James said, well, you ought to just go. You ought to just go ahead and have some joy. Rejoice always. Thank God for everything all the time. Pray without ceasing. Hey, God is at work, so you might as well rejoice. He's going to bring it to pass. <laughs> Count it all joy. I, I mean, that's hard to do when you are lying there in a cold sweat when you are sitting in a waiting room waiting for the, the doctor to tell you something. Oh, I could just go from one situation to another. That's hard to do. But James said, my brothers and my sisters, count it a joyful thing that God has trusted you to go through this so that he may perfect, perfect patience in you. And as you go through it, you are being more and more trained, disciplined, and qualified to sit on a throne forever in righteousness. I remember when I was a little boy, uh, nine years old. Well, actually, from five to somewhere 12, we, in our church, we had the children's choir. Yeah, that long ago. 
we had a children's choir. I didn't like the children's choir. The children's choir always sang before Sunday school. So, uh, I, as I said this morning, Bernice or Rachel would say, I want all the kids to come up. We're going to have choir this morning before Sunday school. And all the kids just run up to the choir. I didn't. I didn't want to be up there with those children. But my dad looked at me and said, you're going. And I saw my mother. That was an awful look. And she would do this. Which means I'm going to take a plug. And she'd do it, wouldn't she? She'd pinch a plug out of you. So... I would just stomp up to the children's choir. Dennis did the same thing. I don't know about Janice. She was always kind of sweet, but I just went up there, and I hated it when one of them would say, okay, today we're going to sing Jesus Never Fails. Uh, Jesus never fails, never, never fails. I'm glad, so glad Jesus never fails. That was it. We'd sung it a thousand times. But oh, on some occasion, she'd say, now today, children, we're going to do it in a round. A third start, the next third sing, and the third third join in. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Never, never fails. I'm glad, so glad, Jesus never fails. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> Lots of decades have passed since then. I can sing it this morning, but I'll have a different look on my face. I can sing it this morning, and it has a new meaning for me. It might, might have been a child's song back then, but it's a preacher's testimony this morning. I can tell you this from the bottom of my soul. Jesus never fails. Never, never fails. I'm glad, so glad, Jesus never fails. He cannot fail. Jesus cannot fail. Sometimes, I'm not really sure people know what pastors do. You see us on the stage or at weddings and funerals and around town, but you don't know what, I'm, I'm, just, I'm talking about real called shepherds. I've been having a little problem lately understanding something about God, and I, I let him know it. Of course, very fearfully and reverently. I said, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand why you haven't done something. This is hurting people. This is a dangerous situation, Lord. Do you see this? In fact, yesterday, I was here in the sanctuary. It was dark. I don't turn the lights on because I don't know how. <laughs> I just don't. And it's cold in this dark sanctuary. And it was cold enough that I brought a blanket. And I've walked up and down these aisles yesterday and I touched the pews you're sitting on. And I, I said to the Lord, I don't understand we have prayed and sought. We've even fasted. I don't understand why you let this keep going on. And I'm just walking and praying. And I walked right out that door into the lobby and turned to the left. And I don't know if you know it or not, but there are eight scriptures on the lobby walls out there in gold letters. Picked out scriptures. They said, Pastor, these are your favorite scriptures and we're going to put them on the wall. And so I turned and as I looked at the wall, I saw it. 
And the Lord was saying, I know what I'm doing. I've heard you say you don't understand, but you don't understand. Read it. And it said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And the Lord said, see there? There it is, your favorite scripture. You don't understand. Church, we don't understand. We cannot lean to our own understanding. What seems to me to be a slow God, a deaf God, a God that seems to be concerned about something in Israel or Lebanon rather than my life. I forgot that he knows every step. And he started something, and what he started, he's going to finish. And Jesus never fails. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, he never fails. And it doesn't matter how, how much I don't understand, he never fails fails because he cannot fail. So as I walked here yesterday and prayed and cried and said, Lord, then give me a message for the church. I don't know what to preach. I didn't just start yesterday. That preparation for next Sunday will start when I say amen today. Lord, give me the word. Some people need to be encouraged. And then, Lord, some people need to be warned. And Lord, I can't do this without you. I can do nothing so what I'm preaching to you today, I'm trusting is a word for you today. You don't understand, but God is in control. And you can't figure it out. And you, it feels like time is getting away and things are deteriorating in this situation. But it isn't because Jesus never fails. I'm sorry. I just have to say it because it's the truth. And so I would say to everybody here today, whatever situation you're in, look at Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look for Jesus. Look at Jesus. He's the author and finisher of your faith. Look to Jesus. He's the supplier of all your needs. Look for Jesus. He's coming back any day now to take his church away. Amen. I found this beautiful thing. Joshua has lived a good life. He was the good commander for Moses. He has completed his years as leader, and he's going to die now. This is what Joshua said to the people he led. Behold this day, I am going the way of all the earth. He said, I'm going to die. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you not one word of them has failed. Did you hear it? Not one. Joshua said these whole 40 years, when you're walking around in circles, didn't have enough. God met your need. God supplied your need. God protected you. God led you. And not one promise has failed. Not one word fell to the ground. Listen to the preacher this morning. I'm telling you, whatever God said will come to pass. His words will not evaporate. They will not fall to the ground. Every word will come to pass. Thus saith the Lord of glory. Hold up. Here it goes. I just want to get it out of my system. Jesus will not fail you. God cannot lie. God does not change. 
God is not weak. God is not weary. God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. His word is forever settled in the heavens. He cannot be defeated. His plans cannot be thwarted. His purpose will be finished. And what he started, he'll finish in your life. <laughs> Hallelujah to God forevermore. Hallelujah to God forevermore. I know you can do better than that this morning. Stand with me, please. Did I tell the truth? Do you believe the truth? Then count it all joy. Count it all joy. Thank you, Jesus. Folks, it's going to be over soon. We'll be glad for every sacrifice of praise we made. We'll be thankful that we lifted our hands when we felt like falling on our face. Praise the Lord. Jesus never fails. Never. Never. Tis so sweet to trust Him more. You know I like altar calls. First of all, I want to say, if you do not know Jesus as Savior, he, the Son of God, died on a cross for you. He saw you. He loved you. He died so that all of your sins could be forgiven, washed away, removed. When you come to Jesus, you get to start all over. You don't have a past anymore. When you come to Jesus, that's your birthday. And you get to live in Jesus from now on. Jesus wants you to go to heaven. Without him, you'll go to hell where the fire never burns out. But the good news is he already paid the price for all of your sins. So it doesn't matter what you did, with whom you did it, how many times you've done it, just looking at Jesus and saying, please forgive me of my sins. Something will happen in your life. You'll never be the same. And today, you can be forgiven and saved. Today, right here. For the remainder of you who already know Jesus, but happen to be fighting the good fight of faith, and sometimes it feels like you're slipping and falling, come on down here. Yeah, come on down here. I want to sing a song with you. I want us to sing together. I want some weary, beaten up people come down here and hold my hands up when we sing. Come on. Amen. Jesus cares about everybody in this building. Jesus. Bless you. Bless you. If I leave as despondent as I came, this was for nothing. If I leave still burdened and weary, this really didn't matter. I, can I quote 
Uh, Sandra gave me a quote this morning. Charles Spurgeon said, Anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It only empties today of its strength. I'm going to walk out rejoicing today. And you can too. Because what God started, God's going to finish. And Jesus never fails. So we're going to join David.